I'd like to welcome any visitors. Glad to have you with us this morning. It's on. Well, tonight, BBS starts. Encourage everyone to come to that tonight. I'd like to thank everyone to help for setting up. We got, we got all the heavy stuff out this week, so I'd like to thank everyone for that. Uh, along with that, the uh, there'll be a long bell ring at 7:40, reminding classes to dismiss to the auditorium. And then along with that, there'll be a, the communion tonight will be in the back uh, during that break. So I'll let everyone know that. Remember, August the 1st, the prime timers will be getting together in the new portion of the church building at 6 o'clock for finger foods and great fellowship. You want to remember the harvest table in the back for the garden uh, plentiful extras. You want to remember all those on our sick list. Uh, Sister June Boone, I want to especially remember her and our prayers. She had a heart attack. Uh, this week, she had 90% blockage. So we want to keep her in our prayers. Along with Kelly Herman, who had surgery, <clears throat> he's still in the hospital. And uh, Julie said he'll probably go to a rehab tomorrow. We want to keep him in our prayers. Along as well, these others, that's a rather lengthy list. And that is all I have. Hang on, we'll... Maybe a little loud, Luther, if you guys, you judge it.
pray with me. Dear God and our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this day you've given us. We're thankful for this time that we have to come together and sing praises unto you and to study your word. We pray that everything we do today is uplifting to you and is done in truth. We pray that you be with our uh, Vacation Bible School this week. We ask that we make it a success and that we bring many souls to you. Be with our nation, Lord. Help us to return back to the one God once God-fearing and God-loving nation that we were. Help us to always put you first, Lord. Be with uh, Colin as he brings our lesson today. Help him to have a steady rec recollection, a ready recollection of what he has prepared for us and bring your word in truth. Be with our elders, Rick and Paul. Help be with them as they guide us and help us to always do things that are best to bring others to you. Forgive us when we fail you, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Mike. Next song will be only on the screen. won't be in the book. And then uh, so will the one following that. <clears throat> this is to do the, to the tune of Mary Had a Little Lamb so if, if you don't know it listen to the person next to you they'll teach it to you as you go along <clears throat> Jesus went to sleep at
verse in that book that we had, uh, BBS will tell students when they're going to sing those and then we'll we'll uh, we'll take to the next one. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Jesus died for all the children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus died for all the children of the world. Jesus rose for all the children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus rose for all the children of the world. come to this part of our service. We come to this part of our service that is of great significance for the Christian because our faith in all that we believe to be true about the Lord and about his promise to us is signified here on this table this morning. For as we take the bread, we remember that he offered up his body on the cross, not for any sins in his own life, but for my sin and for your sin. And when we partake of the blood, we remember from the fruit of the vine, we remember the blood that the Lord shed from his body that we might have life. So as we do this this morning, let's commemorate this feast in remembering what Jesus has done for us. You know, we stop from our singing and from other things that we're doing this morning and give this a special place in our hearts and in our minds. So let's think about those things this morning as we partake of this feast. Pray with me, please. Most precious. Holy Father, we thank you this day that we could come and worship you. And thank you for everything that you've done to us for us, Lord. And Lord, we know that that sacrifice that you sent your son to die on that cross, Lord, was the only way that we had. And we thank you so much for that sacrifice. Lord, as we partake of this bread, it represents your body. We pray that we'll take it in a way that's well-pleasing to you. Lord, we love you. In your precious holy name we pray. Amen.
Our dear Heavenly Father, we, we continue to ask for your blessings on this fruit of the vine, which represents the blood that your Son, our Savior, shed on the cross for our sins, Father. Father, thank you for your love that you sent your Son to this earth. We thank you for Jesus' love that he came, Father, and lived a life without sin, Father, that he might be the sacrifice that we needed on the cross, Father, for our sins. We pray, Father, that as we partake of this, we be mindful of the love, the sacrifice that he made for us, and take us away and be pleased in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. This concludes the Lord's Supper. Did we overlook anyone? We'll now have the prayer for the offering. God, we give thanks for your presence in our lives. Bless these offerings that they be used to advance your kingdom and glorify your name. And may our faith continue to grow stronger each day, bringing us closer to you. Amen.
before Colin brings our lesson this morning, we will sing 574. Oh, how I love Jesus. 574. And if you'd like to mark your books for our invitation song, it will be 674. 574 and 674. <coughs> There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its word, it sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me, it tells me of the Savior's love, who died to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. morning. I thought about preaching from that ark up there, but I thought if I messed anything up, I wouldn't want Michelle and Helen and Deborah and all those that worked on it after me, so I better just stay down here. This morning, if you would like to turn in your Bibles to, we'll be in, we'll start in 1 Samuel chapter 13, we'll be to chapter 17 here in a minute, but this is a a lesson that's kind of dear to me. This is one of my son's favorite Bible stories is the account of David and Goliath. But oftentimes we, we hear or we know that David is referred to in the Bible as a man after God's own heart. And I wanted to look at why David was a man after God's own heart. And in the context where we first see that term, it comes in 1 Samuel chapter 13, where we have the mentioning of one that would be a man after God's own heart, and from looking at who the next, next king would be, and later on we have Paul confirm this in Acts chapter 13, that it, would, it was referring to David. Let us look at the context surrounding what is going on here in chapter 13 that resorts to God saying that, he is going to put someone in the place of Saul that would be a man after God's own heart. Here we see in chapter 13, we see where Saul kind of shows us his heart and, and the issue behind his leadership in the kingdom. Saul was up and down when it came to being a, a godly person. There was times where he appeared to be uh, kind of on the outside, putting on a show, it seemed, as if to lead people in a godly way, but really Saul was more after his own heart. He, he wanted to do his own will. And we see that here in chapter 13 of 1 Samuel. If you would, let's consider the context here leading up to that and look at verse 12. 1 Samuel chapter 13, look there at verse 12. 
Then I said, The Philistines will now come down on me at Gilgal, and I have not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore, I felt compelled and offered a burnt offering. Here you had Saul, and the, the Philistines were coming upon him. Samuel was supposed to meet him there so that he could offer a sacrifice to the Lord. And the Philistines were pressing, pressing in. He was feeling a little pressured. And we notice here in verse 12, I felt compelled. I felt as if I needed to do something. And therefore, he offered a burnt offering. Well, there's a problem with that. And the problem was that Samuel was not a priest. He wasn't of the tribe of Levi. He had no authorization to be able to do this. He knew in his mind, well, that's what God wants. God wants, you know, worship. He wants his his offering made and so well Samuel's not here so well let's go ahead and do that so he'll be with me well notice what Samuel says there in the next verse in verse 13 and Samuel said to Saul you have done foolishly you have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God which he commanded you for now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever Samuel let Saul know you've done foolishly you didn't listen to what God told you to do. Instead, you felt compelled and you took it upon yourself to do what you thought was best. And because of this, we see where the Lord was going to take away the kingdom from him. And then we have introduced to us in verse 14 that it was going to be given to one who would do the will of God. And as we mentioned there in Acts chapter 13 and verse 22, we see there where it was David that would be that man. And so in the context here, we see exactly why David was going to be put in place, and that was because Saul didn't want to follow God's will. He had his own agenda. He had his own will, and that's seen throughout the rest of Saul's life. And David was going to be one that would follow after the will of God. Now, does that mean he was going to be perfect or he was going to be sinless? No. We see David had faults. But when it came to following God and doing his will, we see where David is given that term, a man after God's own heart, because that's what he desired to do. And if you look, as we get closer to chapter 17, real quick, in chapter 15, of 1 Samuel. Notice another instance with Saul in verse 22. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. So Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offering and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of the rams. Saul was more concerned with getting the box is checked versus just obeying God. He was more worried about saving his own hide at times and, and making sure, well, you know, we, we gave God what, what he wanted when if he would just obey in the first place, he wouldn't have got into some of the situations that he was in. David, we see, came on to, see, to the scene, and I want to look at his life from an early standpoint in the first account that we, we have of him, not the first mentioning, but the first account here, after he was anointed as king, we see here the account of David and Goliath and learn from the things that David had instilled in him when he was younger to what made him become that man after God's own heart. And so the first thing we see in this account of 1 Samuel chapter 17 is that David was confident in the Lord. Goliath, on the other hand, his opponent, we learn in the first few verses here of chapter 17 that Goliath was a very large man. He was, he was a giant. Now, from your sources, depending upon where you might find them, he was anywhere from 9 foot, 6 inches to 6 foot. Well, six foot doesn't sound large, but when you think about the kind of the common height at that time, it, it was about five six. I should have lived in that time. I would have been about normal height. 
But here, we don't know maybe exactly, but he was taller than everybody else. He was a, a giant man. And Goliath put his confidence in his physical attributes. The fact that he was tall. He came to the battlefield with a bronze helmet. These things that he wore, he was decked out in this armor. His helmet was about 30 pounds. I can't imagine going to the battlefield with that. And so you can see by the fact that his helmet was 30 pounds and his chain mail, the coat that he wore was 150 pounds. That's a lot of weight. And so this is a large man to be able to, to go to battle with those things. But that was where Goliath and his confidence was, was in his physical abilities. The ability to be able to have this armor that was around him. He carried a javelin that was another 30 pounds with him. And alongside that, you can see there the, the things on his shins. He was fully surrounded by armor. And that was his confidence. You see later on in chapter 17, if you would look at verse 43... Another part of Goliath and the Philistines' confidence was in their gods. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 43, so, Phil, so the Philistines said to David, Am I a dog that you should come and with me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. That was their confidence. This is the Philistine god. That's who they put their confidence in was a made-up, lifeless idol. And they went to battle for that God. They went to battle with that confidence on physical things. And we might think to ourselves, well, you know, we're not like Goliath. We don't put our confidence in a half-merman and physical things, but... Do we not sometimes? Do we not put too much confidence in physical things that we surround ourselves with? You know, David was confident, truly, but he was confident in God. Goliath put his life on the line, and, and he knew that his armor around him would, would protect him. That's what he thought. Well, we oftentimes, we, we surround ourselves with the nicest things, and, and we work hard to, to have a, a, a nice bank account that, that gives us some confidence, you know, to drive a nice vehicle that gives us some confidence to know that it's not going to, to break down or, or something along those lines. We, we put a lot of confidence in physical things, and it's not wrong to have those things, but when we think that everything's going to be okay because of those things, then our confidence is where? in those physical things and it's not on God David on the other hand we learn here his confidence was in God he was also a confident man but notice particularly if you look there in verse 20 of chapter 17 David is going to do what he was instructed to do to deliver some goods and some food to his brothers there on the battlefield he wasn't on the battlefield himself his brothers were but David goes to them to bring them some things, and he sees Goliath issue his daily challenge to the Philistines to come and to, to fight him. And if they would fight Goliath and they would win, if there was a man that could do that, well, then they would be their servants. But if Goliath and the Philistines won, well, then they would have to be, the, the Israelites would have to be their servants. So David heard him issue this, but instead of being terrified as everybody else were, was there, look at verse 24, and all of it, the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. That was the reaction every time Goliath issued this challenge. Verse 25, so the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel, and that shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel, When David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach, reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? 
David was a confident man asking about this. Well, you know, if I go and fight Goliath, this is the things I'm going to get. Maybe he had a little bit incentive of trying to go and defeat Goliath. But we learn a lot from David's confidence in the latter part of that verse 26. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine? David realized and his confidence was in the blessings that came from God. He realized in saying that the Philistine, this is an uncircumcised Philistine. What does that mean? He doesn't have the blessings and the promises of God. And yet he's out there issuing this, defiling God's name, and we're just going to let him keep doing that? We're the circumcised. We're the ones that has God's blessings. Our confidence should be in God. And here's a man out here that is uncircumcised, threatening us, and we're running away terrified. He doesn't have God on his side. We learn a lot again from this conclusion that was drawn. If you go back a chapter, a couple chapters to chapter 14, we see this in another man named Jonathan, who Jonathan and David, they got along real well, and I wonder if it's because of their faith, their confidence in the Lord. Notice what Jonathan came to the conclusion of in 1 Samuel chapter 14. Look there in verse 6. We had again another altercation, another fight with the Philistines. And Jonathan said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of the uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing restrains the Lord from saving by few, by many, or by few. Jonathan knew those, those over there, they don't have God with them. They're not blessed by God. We are of the circumcised. We are of God's people. And they had the confidence to go over there, and he knew that God, he can save by many or by few. That's the power of God. That's the confidence that Jonathan had, and that's the confidence that David had as well. And notice another thing that he says there in that verse. Notice the living God. Where was the Philistine and their faith in? The half merman. An idol. Something they had created. And by saying there in verse, in, back in 1 Samuel chapter 17, there at the end of verse 26, who should defy the armies of the living God? David's confidence was in the living God. He knew that God could save by many or by few. He could save by not even using David. He, could, he didn't need any help because he was a living being. He wasn't some fake idol that they had put their trust in and they had put their confidence in. David put his confidence in God. And that was able to allow such a, a young man to not be afraid of this challenge, to not be afraid of this enemy that had been a, a, a thorn in the, in the Israelite side for, for many, many years. And David wasn't afraid. Why? Because he had confidence in the, in the living God. That when he said, you are my people, and I will bless you, that he meant it. Where is our confidence today? Do we have the same confidence in the same living God as David did? To the point where we see there in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 6 that we can boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. You see, to live this life, sometimes it takes a lot of confidence in God. When we're faced with, with hard things and we're faced with issues in life. It can be real quick to run to physical things. Well, if we've got money, it can solve it. Or if we have friends and family, they can comfort us. Sometimes we use those physical things to, to help out, but where is our confidence? Is it in the Lord first? Or is it in our physical treasures and abilities and attributes? The next thing we see there in, in David in his early life is that he was very courageous. He was courageous in the Lord. 
But if you back up and you look at Goliath and the Philistines, their courage was where? Well, they were placing their courage in Goliath. That he would be able to go and he would be able to defeat whoever Israel sent out. If you look at the account there, the valley, that's the valley of Elah. It wasn't set up for a, a fight, for chariots and, and the normal fight that everybody uh, would normally engage in. And so the Philistines thought, well, if we send Goliath out there for 30 days and he issues this warning, well, surely they'll give in. And then we have victory because there's nobody going to be able to come and, and defeat Goliath. They don't have a man that could do that. And so their confidence was placed fully in Goliath, that he would deliver them a victory out on the battlefield. Well, where was David's courage? Where did it come from? David was a man of courage. If you look there in verses 34, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 34, But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or bear came and took out a lamb of the flock, I went after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose again against me, I caught it by the beard and struck it and killed it. That's a pretty courageous person. Now when you're watching over your flock and a lion or a bear comes and gets one of the sheep, what did he go and do? He caught the lion by the beard and got the sheep away and into safety. That's a pretty courageous person. I don't know that I could do that. But David, we see, was a man of courage. But notice in the next verse, where did David's courage come from? Verse 36. Your, your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like the one of them. Notice the confidence. Seeing that he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord will be with you. He went out and he caught that lion, he caught that bear, but he did so how? By his own strength, by his own courage? No, because of God. God had delivered him from those times. And he knew that God would deliver him from the Philistine. Why? Because he's a living God. It, it, it kind of reminded me of the time there of Elijah on, on the Mount of Carmel. And he said, you know, bring the prophets of Baal and set up an altar and I'll set up an altar and we'll call out and we'll see who's going to help. And the prophets of Baal, they set up their altar and they spent all day calling on Baal and all these things. And Elijah just kind of mocked him and said, well, keep going. Maybe he's busy. Maybe he's asleep. You know, keep on going. And they kept on going. And, and guess what? He never answered. Why? Because he's not real. But when Elijah did it, what happened? God answered because he's a living God. That was the courage that David put his faith because he knew that if he did what God had told him to do and he followed what he was supposed to follow and lived how he was supposed to live, that God would deliver him. And we see where he did. David's courage came from God. Where does our courage come from today? Do we put our courage in, again, those physical things? Or do we put our courage in God? If you look at Philippians chapter 1 real quick. Philippians chapter 1. Look there at about verse 27. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation and that from God." David's courage and what led him to overcome Goliath, to let, that, what, that led him to overcome his adversary was from God. We have an adversary today. 
That adversary walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he, he may devour. It's going to take courage in this life to live a Christian life. And is our courage placed in God? Is it placed in living that the living a conduct worthy of the gospel, meaning living a Christian life? Do we have courage that God is going to deliver us from the devil if we follow his will? Or is our courage, again, in the physical things? Do we put our courage in our family or our friends or the things we drive or the lifestyles that we have or the home that we live in? David put his courage in God first, and then we see the blessings that came from that. The next thing we see from those two attributes, from the confidence and the courage that David had as a young, as a young man, that what led him to be that man after God's own heart throughout his life is that he conformed to the Lord's will. It took confidence, it took courage, but it led David to be a leader, not a follower. If you compare him to Saul, Saul was a man that, well, he sometimes was led by the people. If you back up uh, to chapter 15 that we referenced earlier, there were, Saul was sparing King Agag, and Samuel told him that, you know, the Lord delights not in your burnt offerings, but in obedience. Well, in that same chapter, notice what Saul's excuse was in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 24. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned and I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord of, and your words because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Saul blames the people. He said, well, you know, I feared what they were going to do to me. And so I listened to them, and I spared King Agag, whether that was the real reason or not. That's the, the blame that he passed. He let people lead him to sin, and what did David do? David followed. He was a leader of people. He persuaded men. There in 1 Samuel chapter 24, where the men were wanting to kill Saul, the Lord's anointed, the king at the time, and David did what? He talked them out of it. So don't kill the, the Lord's anointed. He kept the men from falling into sin. There was times in David's life he needed persuading himself. But every time, what? He listened to what the Lord said. He led and he didn't follow. How much better off today would we be if we led people to Christ rather than letting people lead us to sin? David was a leader and not a follower. Another thing we learn about David throughout his life is that he learned to hate sin as much as God does. Again, that doesn't mean he didn't sin, but that when he did sin, he acknowledged that. One of, we have more account of David acknowledging his sin than probably anybody in the Bible. He wrote psalms about it. The fact that whenever he, was, he had committed the affair with Bathsheba, how it really it cut him to the core. Read Psalm 51. It's all about that time, about Lord having uh, mercy on him, wiping that away, and that it was always before him, David, that is, that he would always remember what he did and how that he had sinned against God. It hurt David. And we see time and time again when David would fall and when he would stumble and, and sin that he acknowledged that and how much it hurt him. He took sin seriously, and he learned to hate it as much as God does because he realized that it put him in bondage. When he committed that sin with Bathsheba, what then did he have to do? Well, he had to commit another sin to cover that up. And when we give in to sin, what happens? It's just a snowball effect, and we're a slave to sin. And that's what Christ came to, to set us free from, right? But how? By hating it as much as God does to want to get away from it, because why? It separates you from God. Another thing that we see from David is that he learned to obey God. He learned to be obedient to God throughout his life rather than 
giving in to his own desires. Look at 1 Chronicles, if you would. 1 Chronicles chapter 14. Let's begin there in verse 14. 1 Chronicles chapter 14, beginning in verse 14, David was a man that throughout his life, he went to God. He inquired upon God. He let God lead him in his life. In 1 Chronicles chapter 14, looking there at verse 14, we see where David did this. And therefore David inquired again of God, and God said to him, You shall go up after them, circ circle around them, and come upon them in front of the mulberry trees. And it shall be when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the mulberry trees, then you shall go out to battle, for God has gone out before you to strike the camp of the Philistines. So David did as God commanded him. David did what God wanted him to do throughout his life. And it started with what? The confidence and the courage that he had in God, knowing that when God tells me that he's with me, I'll go out before you, so don't worry about it. That he means that. It takes confidence and courage, right, in our life, that when God tells us something, that he really truly means it. We have a whole Old Testament full of examples to show that when God says something, it's going to come true. But yet, here we are living this life, and you can see accounts in the New Testament where they would say, you know, well, Christ hasn't come back. So he's, he's not coming back. That God promised us what? That we are his people today. And so we, if we are obedient to him, then he will be with us. He will bless us. But what must we do? We must not conform to our own desires, to the world around us, yet we must conform to the will of the Father. And we too can be a person. That's what that means. It's not a man as in only a man can be somebody after God's own heart. It's a person after God's own heart. We can too be a person after God's own heart. How? If we're just obedient to his will. Turn with me to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. This is oftentimes a, a verse used to not conforming to the world, and, and rightfully so, as we see there in Romans chapter 12, beginning there in verse 1 and 2, that we are not supposed to conform to the world. But I want you to notice chapter 11, the end of chapter 11. We won't read it all for time's sake, but... In chapter 11, Paul is spending the majority of the time telling them that Israel rejected God. And how did they reject God? Because they didn't obey. They weren't obedient. And so he spends that time telling them about those things. If you look there in verse 32 of chapter 11, right before we get to chapter 12, "...for God has committed them all to disobedience." that he might have mercy on all. They were disobedient. Therefore, you get to chapter 12 and then says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, because of the history that you have, the examples that you have of a people that were disobedient to God time and time and time again, and yet you can see from their life, you can see from their story that when they were disobedient, guess what happened? They received the curses. Things didn't go according to... Their plans. Why? Because God was no longer with them. But that when they were obedient, when they, when they stuck out and they didn't do like the things of the world did, that was the problem with Israel, right? They conformed to the world. They offered sacrifices to the world's gods. They wanted to look like the world. They wanted to have a king like the rest of the world had. That was their problem. They conformed to the world through disobedience. And Paul says, because you have knowledge of that, because you know that when you are disobedient and when you do conform to the world, that you don't have God, you don't have his blessings, I beseech you, I beg you, therefore, do not conform to it, but instead be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind, getting rid of the old junk, getting rid of the old sin, getting rid of the worldly things that pollute your life and live for God each and every day, that you can prove through your life what is that good and acceptable will. 
That's what God wanted his people to do in the Old Testament. That's what God wants his people to do today. Prove it how? By not blending in, by standing out, by being a person after my own heart, meaning to follow my will and not your own. That's what we learned from David throughout his life. That yes, when he did fall, yes, he did stumble, but he got back up again and tried even harder to, to conform to the will of the Father. When David went out to that battlefield, we know the rest of the story. I didn't finish it, but we know it. When David went out to the battlefield, did he go out in any armor? No. That's why we had Goliath that we read, you come to me with sticks, am I a dog? Are we going to play fetch? What did David go out to the battlefield with? Let's look. Look there at verse 45, going back to 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17, look what David went to the battlefield with. Verse 45, Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. David acknowledged it, right? You come to me with your physical things. You put your confidence in your, your javelin and your, your sword. He had a, a nice sword. Saul called it what? It was unlike any other. You come to me with those things, but what do I come to you with? I come to you in the name of the Lord. That was what David went out there with. Yes, he killed the Goliath how? With a, a stone and a slingshot, but you think that would have happened if he didn't have God on his side? When we live this life, if we truly decide to put Christ on in baptism, and we decide to be a Christian, Paul tells us time and time again, you're going to fight a battle. It's not a physical one, it's a spiritual one. We don't go out into this life and put our confidence and our courage in our physical things, in our physical lives, if we do, we'll be like Goliath. Instead, our confidence to fight this spiritual battle in this life should be in what? That whatever we do, we do it all how? In the name of the Lord. That's our confidence. That's how we get through this life. That whenever we're faced with things that seem insurmountable, Whenever times are tough, we do everything for the name of the Lord, as David did. And that if we have the confidence and the courage, knowing that we can go out and we can face the things of the world, and face our adversary, that if we have God on our side, then who can be against us? This morning, if you've not put on Christ then you must realize that you don't have God on your side. There where David called the, the Goliath the uncircumcised, he said that why? Because he wasn't a child of God. He wasn't a person of God. He wasn't part of God's people. Back then it was that they needed to be circumcised. That was a showing there of that they needed to be God's people. But they also had to, to live according to the law that God had get, given them. Well, today we know that we're not under that same law. Christ came and he gave us the new law. The law that we are to follow, the law of Christ. And he told us that we, similar to them, must be obedient to that law. And in doing that, we put on Christ and become a Christian. The way we do that is by hearing what God has told us to do. The new law, the way, the, the gospel that he's given us to, to be able to have that salvation. That if we believe that Christ is the son of the living God, that we have the ability to have those sins washed away. That he is the savior. 
we repent of the sin that's in our life, confess Christ is the, the Son, and be baptized to have the sins washed away. But realize something specific as we're getting ready to speak about Jesus this week, the name of Jesus. That's our theme. When we want to look at examples in the Bible, we can look at people like David, Shirley. We can look at godly men like Paul, who said, imitate me because I imitate Christ. But all those examples, the best example we have is in Jesus. That he literally gave us the example of someone that came to this life, came to this world, was bound by the same hardships we go through. He was hungry, he was thirsty, he was tired, he was dealing with this, dealing with that. All the physical things we deal with today that we sometimes put too much confidence in, trust in. Christ was tempted just like we were, and yet in all those things, he stood out. He didn't conform. What an almighty, powerful Lord we have to follow, to be able to lead us to Christ, he, or lead us to God. He told us what? I am the way, the truth, and the life. If you want to get to the Father, you come through me. The way we do that is by walking how he walked by doing the things that he did. If you are a Christian this morning, and maybe you aren't growing with God, maybe your life has taken a different direction, realize it's going to take confidence and courage to be, get back on the right track. But that confidence and that courage only comes from God. And so therefore, we must learn that when we do all, we do it all in the name of the Lord and we take that strength from Him that He's given us in this life. And so if there's anybody that has a need, that has something keeping them from living the way Christ has told us to live, then let them come forward. Let us help you as we stand and as we sing.